Um, so I'm going to go ahead and invite Lauren up. Um, yeah, you can come on up. This is Lauren Rose. Uh, she, I'll let her pretty much introduce herself for the most part. No, you're good. Um, she works for Call to Peace Ministries, um, an organization that my wife and I um, have worked pretty closely with over the last year that ministers to uh, victims and survivors of domestic violence, and they also help train churches in how to respond to those situations. Uh, they conducted a training here um, within the last year that was extremely helpful, and they continue to do that at various churches throughout the year. Um, so I'm very, very excited to have Lauren speak. This is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and so we'd asked her to come share a little bit of her story um, and how her church was able to interact with her in that. Um, we are going to have a time of question and answer after she uh, finishes her talk. And um, Grant, can you put up, there should be a, like a green slide. Can one of y'all put that up? Yeah, so just keep this up while she's talking. If you go to slido.com, enter in that code, you can type in a question to ask, um, and you can vote on questions that you like and that kind of thing. Wanted to try it as a way to kind of get us thinking about questions instead of having an awkward time at the end where no one really knows what to say. Um, so hopefully that will facilitate that well. Anyway, uh, thank you, Lauren, for being here. Very excited, and go ahead. Thank you for having me today. Um, my name, as he said, is Lauren Rose, and I work for Call to Peace Ministries. I've worked for them a little over a year, but have been connected with them for almost four years. So I wanted to start with a scripture verse today um, that I feel really sums up my journey and my story. Um, so it's found in Genesis 16. I'm going to read it off here. And it's the story of Hagar. And when Sarah kind of makes a wrong choice and chooses to give Hagar to be Abraham's um, partner to have a child, when she conceives, she changes her mind and decides she made a mistake. And the Bible says she treated her very harshly, so harshly that Hagar had to flee. Um, Hagar is alone and is crying by a well. And God sees her. And God, she responds after not only God sees her, but also gives her a plan for redemption. She says, so, Genesis sixteen thirteen. so she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God of seeing. For she said, truly, I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well was called Beer La Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And then we read more of the story and see that God was faithful to Hagar and actually did what he promised. So that's kind of a, a wraps up my story. It's the unique way I felt like God has kind of spoken to me through my journey. Um, my journey does involve an abusive marriage, but it didn't really start there. Um, my journey started, my family was a very homeschooling, was a conservative homeschooling family. And we joined a organization called Institute and Basic Life Principles um, when I was 17. And I ended up working for a man there and I watched him be very friendly to young girls. And it was inappropriate and I couldn't figure out what was going on. I didn't know how to describe it. I would go to leaders and try to tell them what I saw, but they would just dismiss me and be like, that's not true. Something's wrong with you. I don't know what you're seeing. So anyway, I prayed and I said, God, I don't know what's going on here. And I heard God speak to me and God said, I have seen everything here and someday I'll use you in court to testify against him. And at the time I was like, what in the world? Well, flash forward 10 years later, um, the hands and feet of God, I couldn't have done that by myself. We had one of the number five lawyers in the nation representing us and were actually taken to court where I had to testify against him for what he was doing and what God has seen. Um, even though I didn't have the words to speak it or say it at the time, God saw everything. Um, later I could explain it as I have healed from my own um, trauma from being controlled by him and be able to share what I saw, what was going on and be able to understand the dynamics of abuse. But at the time I just didn't understand it. Um, sadly, I also ended up in a domestically abusive marriage um, and was trying to explain it to everybody around me. Um, I had a bruise. I remember looking out of the ocean and I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to, to explain this to anybody. Like, I don't know how to get out. Like there's just, I don't even know what to do. Marriage just for life. There, I just, I can't live this way. And that's when I heard God speak to me again. And God said, I have seen everything in your marriage. And 
I don't know. I just remember crying as I looked out in the ocean and I didn't understand what that meant. Like, what does it mean that God sees? What, what does that mean? Um, I heard him say before he saw things, but I mean, at this point I hadn't even been to court, so I don't even know what, but I knew there was something God obviously had seen. God saw everything. But, um, the truth is when God sees, he doesn't leave us there. He actually has a plan for redemption. A month later, I met a lady named Joy Brown Forrest. And she had just started about a year ago, Call to Peace Ministries, and it was just her. And I think there was maybe one other girl volunteering. And she was in a little tiny, tiny office, and I went in there, and for the first time, I felt understood. She pulled down a domestic violence power and control will and began to explain to me how domestic abuse is not just physical abuse, although it can include that. More often than not, it doesn't. But it's a system. It's a power. It's a system of one person maintaining power and control over the other person person um, through manipulation, through threats. Violence only occurs when they feel they have lost complete control. Although I had experienced that, it wasn't the bulk of my marriage. Um, it was from there I understood. And I was like, well, at the time I was in marriage counseling and they were seeing everything going on. They couldn't understand what to do. It was marriage counseling at my church. They had no way to know how to deal with this. Like, obviously I'm in a marriage that's abusive. Um, he's not repentant and it's escalating. So what do you do? So that's when when Joy got involved and um, she started talking with my pastor. Um, she spent hours and hours and hours with my pastor. Um, she spent, she took me through a support group that helped me find healing and wholeness in Christ. Um, she talked with me about Christ um, and it was very painful to me because I felt like people I had trusted that claimed to be Christians were the ones who had abused me the most. And so for me, it really shook my faith in God. And I was like, how can God be good? How can I even trust him? And so she would constantly put me back to the sufferings of Christ and be like, you know, Jesus was crucified by religious leaders. He knows what it's like to be betrayed by religious people. And actually first John was the biggest healing book of my um, journey. I would listen to it every single night and remind myself that those who walk in the light walk in love. They walk in truth. And those who don't, don't know him. And sadly, I believe that a lot of our abuse lurks among religious people. That's where they hid in Jesus's day. They are, they're the ones who killed him. Like if you can think about it, the most religious people Satan was able to work through, although it was part of God's plan, was able to work through to kill Jesus, to deceive them that heavy. They didn't know God. God said they didn't know him. We think of Paul. Like, so Satan works through people who profess to know God, but deny him by their very actions. And so I, I began to find healing and wholeness. And anyway, um, I also, Joy is also my advocate and helped me understand um, the ins and outs of the legal system and how, how do you approach this? What do you do? And help my church understand. My church actually helped me escape my marriage. Um, I probably shouldn't say it that way. I guess my church helped me get to a place of safety. Um, marriage covenant was already broken because of domestic abuse, but they actually um, created a, a place for me to, a way for me to be able to get out and get to a place of safety. I don't really know what I would have done without them. And um, very, very grateful for them and my pastor telling me, he's like, you've had a lot of men in life betray you and not show you Christ. And I want you to know that there are men who do love Jesus and will protect you and desire you to know, desire for you to know God and, um, them helping me get to a place of safety. I remember telling him, I have never felt so loved by God in all my life that he would deliver me and, and set me free. Um, and so they walked with me through the whole process and were very involved. Um, they now today have a domestic abuse policy in their church and they actually have helped um, quite, I know at least one other woman get to a place of safety as well. Um, and so they're advocating for other women today. And so I kind of want to go into call to peace and a little bit more back into the God who sees. So that was four years ago. Since then, call to peace ministries has grown by 608%. We now have advocates internationally all over America. Support groups are all over America as well as internationally. We are averaging right now, as of October 20th, we have had 26 requests for advocates for the month of October. Um, we've had about 25 requests for support groups, and we've had around 15 requests for pastors by October 20th just for help. So it's just amazing how much is exploded. It's sad too, because it is a real need. It's It really does happen. <laughs> it's really happening. And um, churches, I believe, can be one of the safest places for these women to 
to find healing and redemption and be part of the solution. Um, just for a woman to be acknowledged from the pulpit kind of breaks the silence for her to understand that she can come forward and can talk. Um, and also, I believe that it, in a church, it, it forms a deeper accountability when you know that these sins are not okay and they will be confronted. Um, different evidence of understanding, like the power and control. Oh, sorry, type thing. So um, I'm very grateful for that. We have a Protect the Flock conference coming up October 26, if anybody is interested. Um, and we actually have pastors that come and we train them on how to understand and recognize domestic abuse within their church and how to create policies. And so since then, um, Call to Peace has now 13 people on our staff, three of which are um, pastors, full-time pastors that work alongside us as church partner liaisons. So they go into churches and help pastors understand what's going on and just kind of walk beside them, kind of like Joy did for me. Um, and so just helping the pastor understand the dynamics. We also have um, advocates on their staff as well, as well as um, people that are leading support groups and training people to lead support groups. And so there is a constant need um, for more volunteers and for people to be involved. And that kind of leads me back to the God who sees, you know, and that is that God sees, God sees everything. He sees our hearts. He sees the things that go on behind closed doors that nobody else believes. But when God sees, he doesn't just leave us there. And so I'm really grateful for Call to Peace Ministries because I really felt like they were the hands and feet of Jesus. And they were God's way of like helping me escape, even like with the situation. Um, I brought that up about Bill Gothard. Like there had to be other people there to be able to help to bring to pass what God had spoken and to be able to bring to light what was going on in the darkness. And so that's like where our calling comes in is like God sees everything there. Are we willing to be part of the solution and stand up and be able to see what he sees and be able to walk with hurting women and children through domestic abuse? And that's the sad part is domestic abuse doesn't just impact women. It also impacts the children. Um, and we've done a lot of, well, I've done a lot of research on that as well. And um, just the effects of children that grew up in this is, is horrendous. And that was one of my my biggest fear is I was like, I will never do this to my kid, my child. I would never leave a marriage. And my therapist looked at me and he said, I want you to go look up what happens to kids who grew up in domestically abusive homes. And you will find out that what happens to them is way worse than any divorce will ever be for your child. And that really shook me hard. And as I have worked with Call to Peace Ministries the past year, seeing the impacts on children has been some of the hardest things to see. Um, and it's difficult. And so when you are willing to step into this, you're not only helping a woman, you're helping children, you're impacting future generations because children that grew up in this is more likely to end up in abusive homes or end up as abusers themselves. So it is not just a one person problem. This is multi-generational. It's going to keep going. And so Call to Peace Ministries is in need. Um, definitely a people understanding it, being, if you're ever interested in, in leading support groups, um, studying to be, training to be an advocate. Um, and also if you're interested in church, learning more or just being a learning more about it to be a friend to somebody else who's walking through it. We also have a lot of what we call people helpers reaching out and you're welcome to reach out to be able to understand. Um, we can walk with you through the process. If you think you know a friend that's in domestic abuse and you want to help her, we would be happy to talk with you and help you understand what's going on and how you can be a friend and be able to assist her in that and walk with her through that. And then also, um, last but not least least is also, this is our domestic violence awareness month. And so we are trying to reach a goal of a um, hundred thousand dollars this month. So if any of you feel led to give, you can also partner with us that way. I don't know if that's the text. I don't, I think that might be our text. Is that our text? No, it's not our text. Um, but if you go to www.calledtopeace.org, you can learn all about the ways to partner with us as well as um, become a partner in at request an advocate or request a support group leader or become a support group leader or request to become an advocate all through there. Um, and yeah, so I'd say definitely if I have any advice to give to a church, it's just to be open to that and to be open to un trying to understand, understand that and be a safe place because Christ calls us to be a safe place for the abused and the oppressed. You know, Jesus went after the broken and the downtrodden. Um, he went after the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery and he didn't just leave them there. He spoke truth to them and um, ministered to them. So us as a church, we're called to, to be able to offer them healing. And so that would just be my encouragement to you. And thank you so much for letting me share. And if you have any questions, 
later. I look forward to answering those. Thank you. If you want to sit down, you oh, are okay, welcome yeah, I'll sit to. Down. I'm going to sit down. Um, all right. Thank you, Lauren, for sharing all of that. Um, I've got a few questions to try and Q&A time started a little bit. Um, and feel free again to continue submitting questions up there as well mm -hmm. um, as Lauren continues talking. Um, yeah, so um, if I can, um, again, thank you so much for sharing thank your you. story. Really, really appreciate it. Very powerful. Um, I was wondering if, as far as you're comfortable, if you could tell us what some of the abusive dynamics were mm -hmm. in in that relationship for you. Yes, I can talk a little bit um, about abuse. So, sorry. Yeah, here. So, domestic abuse is not. I always grew up thinking. I mean, because so I was claiming I was in a worked for a person who was abusive. Um, it, it wasn't physically abusive. I mean, there was elements of it that were um, at times, but domestic abuse is really found as as a um, system of somebody maintaining power and control over the others. So typically, they're isolating them. Not, they're choosing who their friends are. They're choosing what they do, um, where they work. Um, and anything that gives, they want all the power. So any way that they feel takes power from them, then they typically cut that off and manipulate it. So a lot of times there's a lot of financial abuse that goes along with that. Um, I have heard stories of um, men who have literally given their wives $50 a month for groceries while they made tons of money, but they were using all the money for themselves. That would be a form of domestic abuse. Um, yeah, had one woman, her husband isolated her so much. Um, she, he would threaten, he wouldn't let her go too many places. And so if she, he said, if you're gone while I'm at work, then I will call the police and tell them that you took my car. So it, it's just more of a form of control, um, and using tactics of manipulation, um, threats and domestic violence threats. Like I'm going, you don't know what I can do to you, pulling out weapons, um, yeah, making threats of how they could physically harm them, harming pets, threatening to harm the children um, if you're not doing what they say. Basically, they don't want you to have any voice, any opinion, um, and you are to only think the way they are and to be completely controlled. And no matter how much control you give them or allow you submit to them, they will always demand more because it's never satisfied. So it is a constant sucking system and a game that a lot of women would get caught in that they believe that if they can just be more submissive or if they can just be a better wife, it will all stop and it doesn't and so they try usually they'll say I tried more submission I tried to be a better wife and every time I did it just grew worse because it really it's not about that it's all about them being the one that's in control so if that helps yeah, no, great. Great. thank you oh good yay um, that's very 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 helpful um, as so one of the things that I have heard a lot is that Domestic violence can be difficult to see, like yes. it can be kind of counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. um, can you dive a little bit more into what makes it that way? You know, it's, you've talked about how it can be present in the church. Why is it so hard for us to recognize it for what it is? Yes. So most of the time, people who are domestically abusive are um, very egotistical. They are they think very highly of themselves. They enjoy um, being in church. A lot of times they can be very active in church, um, leading Bible studies, lead, being deacons. But behind closed doors, it is a very different story. So a lot of times it's very hard to recognize because the person you see that they're presenting to you is not who that person knows they are at home. And it's and they also tend to twist it and they do something called gaslighting. So gaslighting is a when you basically make somebody think that what's happening isn't really happening. You're distorting somebody's reality. So like maybe they could be physically violent with their wife at home, um, but they will make them think that didn't really happen. And you may be thinking that's crazy, but they do. So they may be like, oh, I, I didn't mean to do that. You know, I just accidentally threw that and it hit you. You know, you're overreacting. You, you, you shouldn't be upset at this. Like, you know, so they're 
they're playing it up and they're so used to controlling you and twisting you or being like, you know, you provoked me. You made me act that way. You know, you did this. And so that's why I had to do this. And a lot of times women who are in domestic abuse have been through some other form of abuse in their life. It's usually very common. Um, so they are very conditioned to believe everything's their fault. So they kind of twist it and believe it's their fault and they are, can kind of cover it up and be like, Oh no, he's a great husband, father. And then all of a sudden that she comes out and she's like, he's abusive. And it's very hard to believe, but it's because she's been living in this lie of trying to cover things up and trying to present things as okay when they really were not. That's very helpful. Um, so uh, kind of along the same line, just thinking in a church context, um, what are ways that churches can encourage women to stay in those kinds of marriages? Like how do, how do churches end up accidentally reinforcing those things rather than being helpful? Yeah. Um, I would say the way that, yes, there's several things here we can go into. Um, one is marriage counseling. A lot of times when you see domestic abuse, the first thing a church will do is just be like, you need marriage counseling. Well, the problem is when you have a husband who's an alcoholic, you don't look at them and be like, you need marriage counseling and we'll fix his alcoholic. You know, you should really just be a little bit more submissive and pray a little harder and he won't be an alcoholic. You know, you'd be like, that's, that's crazy. And especially if he's a violent alcoholic, you know, you'd be like, that's not going to stop. Um, the same as with domestic violence. It's not a marital issue. And that's where a lot of the hiccup pro happens is they believe that they can fix it in marriage counseling. Ma marriage counseling always, I have talked to so many women, is used as a weapon against them. He, she will literally be silenced by him. He will be told what she can say, what she cannot say. And when she goes home, if she says something she shouldn't say, she's going to reap havoc for that. Um, and so, and he will also can manipulate the counselor and twist it all and make it think it's her fault. So you're just, and, and you're compounding the abuse. Whenever there's domestic abuse present, there needs to be individual counseling immediately and he needs to be held accountable. Um, I would say that's a huge thing. And then also a lot of times people think that it can be solved through more submission or prayer. So they'll be like, my husband, and, and they won't say my husband's abusive. That's not typically the verbiage they'll use is my husband has a problem with anger is usually where you'll hear a lot. My husband gets angry a lot, or I feel like I can't please him and I'm trying so hard. Will you play for me to be a good wife? Just help me pray for me to be a good wife. And when you start hearing those type tones come across, there's usually something more going on. Um, and so a lot of women at first will be like, yes, I'll pray for you. You know, just submit harder, pray harder, you know, and God can change him. But ultimately, Ultimately, only God can change people's hearts. You know, I had a woman once say to me, a pastor told her that she should love her husband as Jesus loved him. He had strangled her um, and convinced the pastor that it didn't really happen and that it was just an accident and he just gets really angry and he can't help it. He has PTSD and da, 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 da. So anyway, um, he told her that you just need to love your husband as Christ loved the church, love, loved his bride. And you can be an example for this. And she said, um, you know, Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. And if Jesus was not an enough for my husband. If his sacrifice was not enough, my love will never be enough. And I was like, you know, that's really, really true. Um, and so it's like understanding that your love is not going to change an abusive person. It just the same as it's not going to change an alcoholic or a drug addict. Like, yeah, it may point them to Christ, but ultimately that decision's theirs. It's power and controls an addiction. Uh, Uzi is almost like an addiction of itself. It's, it's a sense of entitlement and you're desiring that. And it takes about five years to see a man change that is, in, that has been and domestically abusive. Um, and that's with intervention, um, with people who are trained in dealing with, um, domestic abuse. And we have that with cult abuse ministries. We have a men's group where they do in, um, group therapy because that's the most helpful, um, and do intervention. And we have seen some changes, but we know it's three to five years, at least I would say closer to five of consistent change before they before things are better. So, um, there was a question and I lost it. Um, yeah, what are so like if for you know people in here, like what what are or pastors, counselors, that kind of thing? What are you mentioned like some of the things that abused women might say mm -hmm. that are you know it's like oh maybe there's something more looking into. Are there other signs that people can just sort of be aware of like? Oh, like, even if it's just to tell the pastor, like, I'm concerned about this mm -hmm. or like, what are some other common signs or red flags that people can either see in a marriage looking in from the outside or that, you know, maybe in a dating relationship or something like that? 
Yes. So I would start with dating. Um, typically, these men are very charming in dating, and they put on a facade and they move very quickly because they don't. They can only maintain their facade for so long. So you, a lot of times, these women think they're marrying their prince charming, and then they're married, and they wake up to a literal nightmare. It usually flips overnight um, for them. So um, as far as symptoms in um, anything with dating, is looking for any form of possessiveness and controlling, jealousy, isolation, um, moving really fast is always a huge red flag that something's there that he's hiding. And especially if they're superficially charming, um, there's usually something there he's hiding. Um, and I would say like in a marriage, things to look for is, 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 the, is to watch for the questions and just ask more if you hear somebody saying stuff and you, it kind of just doesn't sit right in your spirit that maybe there's something more there. Um, just kind of ask questions and be like, just, you know, I know I had a friend and be like, well, I can't do that because if I don't get home at this time, like he'll get angry. I can't do that. And I was just, and she's like, why not? And she kept pushing me and she's like, what does anger look like? And I mean that this is the person who actually ended up getting me out. And I was like, no. And I didn't tell her. Um, and then she started watching more and more stuff and watching extreme anxiety like calling every few minutes and, and where are you? What are you doing? And I'm like hosting a brunch with some friends for Christmas and my child. Um, so like it's constant control, constant contact and watch the anxiety. How do they react when they talk about going home or how do they react when they see that? If you notice that they get very anxious, there's usually something going on. Like they're constantly afraid of making him upset. That's usually a very big warning sign that something's going on. Um, is also, I would look for them talking about any type of anger in their home, like praying for anger. And especially when women start saying, pray for me to be a better wife. I'm a really bad wife. Just start questioning that a little bit. Like, well, what does me, what does that mean to be a bad wife? Like that's not a normal thing people should be saying, you know, like, I mean, yes, I'll be like, Hey, I, I offended my husband and I need to repent and, and deal with this. Pray for me. Cause I'm struggling through this. But when you start saying I, I'm a bad wife or I can't get this right. And I just can't do this. And I, I just, I'm failing here. I'm failing there. When you're hearing things like that, um, that that's usually an indicator. There's something seriously going on. Um, and then also just the way he speaks to her. Um, a lot of times people who have been through abuse themselves can recognize it really quickly. You'll watch that he's very, tends to be um, very isolating and controlling when he has her like eyes on her, watching every, her every movement. Um, especially if you notice that she shrinks back if she's talking to, um, it sounds strange, but like even the pastor or another man, if you notice she gets very nervous and tense and uptight, there might be a reason why maybe he's controlling. Maybe she's not allowed to speak to men. Maybe, um, yeah, watch how she's parenting. If there's anything indicators that she is very tense and uptight around him, there's usually something going on. That was kind of long-winded, but I'm trying to go into it all. <laughs> no, I know. There's, there's a lot that could, that could be said for sure. So, like, as, like, let's say someone becomes, like, they become suspicious. They start seeing some interesting things. They become, from the outside, mm -hmm. you know, they're like, okay, there, there really is very likely something strange going on here. But she is, is unwilling or unable to see it yet, right? Like, she's just not at a yes. place to recognize those things. Like, how do you, yeah, like... Just as a, as a friend, as a brother, sister in Christ, like how do you minister to that person well in those early stages? I would say just keep asking questions um, would be the most important thing is to ask them things and make them think. Um, kind of like with my therapist when I said I could never leave my marriage because that would never tear apart my daughter's family. Make them think for themselves. Um, abuse victims are never given a choice. All their choices are stripped from them. So that's a big thing that we do at Call to Pieces. We allow them to make their own choices. We never tell a woman to leave a marriage ever. Um, unless she's in d severe physical harm and we think she's in immediate danger, we will then tell her, this is what happens. This is the pattern. You're in danger. You really need to look at getting an escape plan. Like that's, that's the only place, but she's been so controlled. You'd really just have to let her make her own choice, but just to kind of always lead in with questions and try to get her to think, um, you know, such as, Hey, look up statistics of what happens to children that go up in domestic abuse, make her think for herself and to, and like, ultimately she knows in her gut what's right and wrong. If the, I mean, I believe like the Holy spirit resides there too, but especially if she's a Christian, but no matter what, like in, Internally, you know, if something's off in a relationship, you know, even in a dating relationship, you know, something's off in your gut. You just have that feeling. She knows that. So it's just kind of tapping into that a little bit and kind of making her question that what's going on and seeing that that's not normal and that's not okay. And just offering to pray for her. Um, and you know, she never, you may never know when she may open up. It takes an average woman probably several points of contact before she'll leave. Um, so, and then they say an average woman leaves seven times and returns before she actually is for good. 
Um, that's not always the case, but it's just understanding, too, that there's a lot of dynamics that go in domestic abuse. He's really brainwashed her in a certain extent. That's how I would refer to it. It's been a lot of control, a lot of manipulation. And there's also something called trauma bonding. So she's bonded to him because when you go through trauma, it, it creates this bond. And so you, it's just a lot of dynamics. Sorry, I'm going to like the more neuroscience aspect of it. There's just a lot of dynamics there. So I would definitely just question and make her feel empowered with her own choice. Um, so on that, like on that kind of same line of thought, what are some of the long-term effects of, of that kind of trauma on a woman, even if she's out of the relationship? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, most women that have been through domestic abuse do have PTSD, what we would actually currently refer to as CPTSD, complex PTSD. So coming out of that, that is a healing process. Um, we believe that um, Jesus is our ultimate healer, and I believe that you are healed when you choose to transform your mind from believing the lies to believing the truth that about Jesus. Um, my healing journey was literally through scripture, a lot of praying, a lot of reading my Bible, and just meditating on God and finding God's truths for what he's says in his word about things versus what I had been told. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a very long process. It takes a woman about three to five years as well to heal from domestic abuse. Um, typically, a lot of women run from the pain. Um, that's a really sad thing to see. It's really hard to go down and face it, but it's something, you, no matter what you've been through in life, if it's something traumatic, you really got to walk into that pain and be willing to feel it and be able to process it and not run to other things to cope. And so that's... Um, yeah, kind of the healing process when you go in there and find Jesus and find him as your ultimate healer. Can you talk a little bit more about the effects that even just witnessing domestic violence can have on kids, you know, mm -hmm. even if they're not necessarily receiving it, living in that kind of environment? Mm -hmm. So children um, don't understand the difference, especially when they're really young between daddy and mommy. Um, <laughs> exactly the domestic abuse, they kind of view it as it almost happening to themselves. Um, so they view their mom and dad as an extension of them. So if they see their mom abused, it's the same impact as if they're being abused themselves, as well as um, children don't think that daddy is not going to get angry at me. So they think if daddy hurts mommy, and he's bigger than me, what will I do if he hurts me? So you kind of put them in their own PTSD. It actually affects a child from the womb. Um, there's plenty of studies that show that um, when the mother's living in that fleet of flight. Um, and, and then a lot of people say, well, what if he never saw him hit her? And, and domestic abuse isn't all physical violence. Um, children know when their mom's afraid of their dad. They sense it. Um, that's just very common. A lot of times, so that happens, you're now dealing with children that have PTSD and their own severe anxiety issues. Um, see, I'm trying to think all the ways it affects them. A lot of times children like that can tend to either internalize it and become abusers themselves, or they become also victims of domestic abuse, um, because they can either associate that abuse gets them what they want and abuse means they're safe. Um, or they can turn the other way and be like, I have to rescue, I have to win to earn love. Um, a lot of times children will also try to stop the violence between the mother and the father and will try to get the attention on themselves and take unwanted spankings, all types of stuff to revert the attention off of themselves. And that's also traumatic for them. Um, so yes, we, we have people on our staff who I've talked to several that have grown up in domestic abuse themselves and the impacts of it are very, very severe. Um, so that, that's also a lifelong process for them, I believe, to come out of and heal, especially when you're very young, it impacts your brain very differently than when you're older. Um, what are some of the ways like in children that, I don't know, just that like those symptoms of trauma, like mm -hmm. what are the ways that those can manifest like in their behavior, even in, I don't know, health or just other things like that? Um, well, some of the people I know that have grown up in domestic abuse have autoimmune disorders. Um, so it really affects their body and their ability. Um, something I always believe is physical abuse is, I mean, emotional abuse is physical abuse. Um, it, it actually shows that like emotional abuse affects us physically and it affects children just as much. So when your body, you don't have the voice to say what's going on, eventually your body is going to talk for you. And usually that is in the form of sickness, um, autoimmune disorders, um, other diseases they're more susceptible to because of their gut system being weak. Um, and yeah, just other 
factors with that. And I'm trying to think the other symptoms, things that kids do, a lot of um, nightmares, um, a lot of anger, a lot of aggression can be hidden deep down inside for children because they just don't have the words to be able to process what's going on in their home. So they typically take it out in verbal ways, um, physical ways, just trying to express it and get it out. Um, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. Um, yeah, that type of stuff is more of what happens. And also another dynamic that happens a lot too, if you have seen the abuse for a longer time is the abusers are going to use their children against the mother. Um, they don't view children like as like, okay, this is like, we should make a good relationship between the mother and the child. They're going to take their children as pawns against the mother and they're going to pit them against her. And that's what we see all the time is where brainwashing happens, where he starts telling their children that your mother is bad. Your mother is crazy. Your mother is this. Your mother doesn't love you. Your mother doesn't care for you. Your mother left us and just all this type of stuff. And that is severely traumatizing to kids. So I work a lot with women, um, we did a lot of interviews this week on Facebook, actually combating a lot of those things. And how do you parent through that? How do you parent through a child that now believes that you're the bad guy? You know, how do you deal with that? Or, um, I've had several other women deal with stuff with, um, pedophilia type stuff, you know, how do you, how do you process through that type thing? Um, and that stuff is just not uncommon, sadly with domestic abuse and, um, pitting them against them. So little bit about um, kind of the reverse situation. We most often hear about and most often see women in domestically abusive relationships. It can also happen the yes. other way around, but it can look a little different from what I understand. Can you talk about men when they're in uh, domestically abusive relationships? I do believe men can definitely be in domestically abusive marriages and relationships. That definitely happens to them. The dynamics look very different. Um, we typically do not see men who are afraid of their wives. And so that is a huge thing is like men are stronger, usually more powerful and will use threats and manipulations and has probably isolated her financially. Um, men can be uh, abused financially, but typically they're not having, not being able to work, not having that taken from them, having their cars monitored and they're living in complete terror of their wives killing them or <laughs> hurting them. So that, that, that is a little bit different there. The dynamics there with, I think with a men, Abuser, um, from what I understand, is more financial, emotional abuse, um, manipulation, course of control type stuff. But it's it's not it, it's just a different different dynamic. So we don't focus a lot on that just because we feel we definitely do have a heart for men um, and men who are being abused. But a lot of times these men can claim that they're being abused <laughs> when they're the abuser themselves. So we just kind of stick to just women um, and also um knowing that women are, we believe are probably the most vulnerable in it usually, um, just because of the circumstances of our culture. I mean, men usually can be the breadwinner. They're usually not isolated and controlled or worried about, um, somebody coming after them that's bigger than them. So, but there is definitely ways men are abused. So, so you would say that like for men, there's not going to be that, like you said, that fearful dynamic of like, oh, I'm going to get hurt, like I'm going to get beat up, killed, but they can be yeah. like emotionally put down, they can be degraded, they can oh, yes, be yes. financially controlled, they can be manipulated and that kind of thing. Yes, women can be very yeah. abusive in themselves. I mean, I mean, anybody can that doesn't have Christ um, and can be very controlling and want her, him to do everything that she wants him to do. So he, she could be, be like, oh, you're so stupid or you coward or you don't do this or you don't do that and just constantly putting him down and making her, building herself up by putting him down and controlling him. And, and so he kind of, I feel like kind of like a dog, more like walking around like a dog with his tail tucked under is kind of like more of a dynamic with the abuse of men where somebody is oppressing him and abusing him. Um, with women, it is more, I am extremely afraid of him and like you're seeing the PTSD because it is, it's just, I, I believe there is a different dynamic when you have somebody twice as big as you threatening you and, and such. So physical violence is just a little bit different. Um, when you were sharing some of your story, you said that there were things that um, other believers or other church members would say that were very unhelpful. Mm -hmm. Can you share what some, some examples of what those things are? Um, 
see, I'm trying to think. I didn't tell a lot of people what was going on. Um, mostly I had somebody tell me they didn't believe me. Um, that was really painful and silenced me for a while um, because he appeared so good in public. So they just said they didn't believe me that that happened. Um, so that it, telling a girl that you do not believe her, I think is probably you will silence her even further because it takes a huge step to be able to step out and say, this is happening in my home. This is what's happening. Like, these are the, this is what's going on. And to say, I don't believe you, I think would be the most, that is the most damaging thing you can do. Um, also just saying, well, what did you do to provoke that or questioning? What did you do to cause him to hit you? Or what did you do to make him say that you must have done something, but not always assuming that she did something to make him act that way. Um, and I think sometimes that's our first inclination is to be like, well, like we don't, it's hard hard if you haven't lived in it to be like, why would somebody do that? Like, why would they do that? You know, did you do something? But it's, it's just, it's not that way. It's really, they are an abuser and there's nothing she probably did to provoke it. I mean, t abuse typically isn't provoked. Um, and so it's just be willing to listen and to get help and understanding and not judge the situation from your, what your marriage looks like or from your own experience, because sometimes it's easy to project your own marriage into somebody else and be like, oh, well, I've had that problem too. And I just prayed more and this is what happened. Um, that may not be the same as their situation. Um, yeah, as far as uh, men or anyone being an abuser, like how would you connect? I mean, I think we would often apply terms like narcissist or sociopath or psychopath like mm -hmm. is there a connection that like how do you think about that is that are those helpful categories to think about I actually do not believe that they are um, we do not claim or talk about men being narcissistic or women being narcissistic um, or mental disorders because we do not want to discriminate against people with mental disorders abuse is not caused by mental disorders abuse is always always, always a choice. Um, it's not caused by bipolar. It's not caused by alcohol. It's caused because that person isn't choosing to be entitled and in, in control. Yes, they may have uh, follow the list of narcissistic behaviors, but narcissism is actually a that is hard to get diagnosed for. And it's, it is a mental disorder. Um, but I don't know that I would necessarily go around being like they're narcissistic. I, I just kind of look at the root of, um, what's going on and be like, that's a root. It's a sin root. It's a sin root of entitlement. It's a, um, root of you seeing yourself as the King and versus seeing Christ as the King and leading via weaponizing other people versus leading via servant leadership. So that's kind of how we would view that. Um, can you go into some more detail about, on the positive side, like things that your church was able mm -hmm. to do to help you, either helpful things people said or helpful things from church leadership or any, any of those things? Um, I would say the most helpful thing, um, trying to think, um, my church did was, yeah, just standing up and believing me, um, especially my pastor being willing to understand the dynamics of domestic abuse and what was going on and being willing to say, this is not okay. We support you. Um, you know, this is not God's design for marriage and speaking God's truth to me was hugely helpful. Um, as far as other women that were very helpful, um, I would say I had one woman that um, prayed with me, the first woman I ever told and started questioning her. And I asked her if this happens in her marriage. It was before another, before I was at the church I was at. And I just said, I want to know, does this happen in your marriage? Is this normal? And she said, that's not normal. That's not okay. And she, I remember her praying with me and telling her husband and they went and appealed to the church and the church I was at, at the time did not handle it well and didn't. Um, so that's why I ended up leaving, going to another church. But so I would just say being willing to, to listen and to be able, willing to validate what's going on was hugely helpful to me um, for women that were very healing and being like, that's not, that's not Christ-like. That's not what God calls us to. You did not deserve that. Um, that's not okay for him to say that or to do that. Um, so just validating what she's feeling, I think is very important. Um, so I know we're running up against time, but you guys are sending in some really good questions. So I hope you're okay if I go over just a little oh, bit. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. um, um, how, so if someone's in a healthy relationship, right? Mm -hmm. But with their partner who has been in the past in a, in a, traumatic relationship and abusive relationship, mm -hmm. what are some good ways for um, 
for them to care for the partner coming out of that. Oh, that's really sweet. Um, well, congratulations to you for caring and, and being a good partner and willing to walk with somebody else who's been through abuse, um, whether they're male or female. Um, I would say to be to know their trigger points and to not push those because they're still, no matter how much you heal, you can not live in your place of trauma anymore. You don't live out of it, but there's still always going to be triggers there. Um, there are certain things that may just set them off, not like in an anger way, but will probably put them in a place of freeze and, and traumatize them. So just know those trigger points. Maybe it's for them never raising your voice. Maybe it's for them, um, you know, and if you do apologize quickly and know that you need to walk away because this is going to really, really trigger them. Um, or it's the way you grab her arm or it could be anything. And it, it may be just very minor stuff, but just being willing to respect those things um, because they could just, you know, the, the trauma lives in our body. And as we heal, it takes a long time and we, we release that in there. It's just certain things our body remembers. And so like our mind may associate a certain touch with abuse or a certain tone or verbiage with abuse. And so just being willing to respect those things. Um, how, what, sorry. Um, so as a church is walking through, um, this kind of situation with, with, you know, mm -hmm. a woman, um, let's say the man abusing her is in the church. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember, I don't know if that was the case for you, at least with the church that was helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but like, what are, what are ways that, helpful ways for um, churches to react to the abuser, interact with the abuser? Uh, like what, what can that process look like? Um, he definitely is still a broken person as well. So it is also coming alongside him and, and encouraging him to pursue Christ and to pursue him for his healing. Um, and also, but not excusing his sin either, you know, when he brings it up and wants to val validation that, um, what he did wasn't as wrong as it's certainly not that, but it's encouraging him, you know, press into Christ, find him through this, you know, find him through repentance. Um, and there's hope and redemption is for you as well. And extending that. I think it's very important to make sure that you're not you're not siding with the abuser and cutting the woman off. That can be extremely painful because it feels like you're turning against her and 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 siding with him and that can feel yeah, anyway. That's that's not very fun, but I think that's very important to have men come alongside him and be willing to to walk with him through that and be willing to hold him accountable because the thing is to realize, especially if they have children together, it doesn't just end once she leaves. Like it keeps going. So him finding Christ and finding healing is actually a really good thing because that impacts her children and their, or their children together um, and impacts any relationship he may be in the future if that's what happens or his work or w with his own parents or whatever that is. So just seeing him as a human being that needs Jesus as well and knowing that Christ is our ultimate redemption and while the marriage may not be able to be restored due to the traumatic um, injuries there, um, knowing that there is hope for him and that he can find Christ in it and still be a good father hopefully if he repents, <laughs> I do, I do not believe the lie. I would say something very strong is a lot of people say, well, he abused his wife, but he's a great father. No, I'm sorry. If you abuse your wife, you're not a great father. No man who loves his children would abuse his mother, mother of the children, because that is so damaging to a child. So damaging. So I would not say that if he is an abuser, he's a good father. He's a selfish, self-centered person and is probably using his children um, to meet his own needs, but he can repent and find Christ and become a good father. And so I do believe believe that um, church should walk alongside him and pray for him in that and pray for him to find Christ through that. Um, right, just a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. How, so like, how can a church or Christians, like how can they disciple men mm -hmm. in a way that help like disciple them to not like away from abusive thought patterns, patterns of behavior, attitudes, that sense of entitlement, like, mm -hmm. On a, on a positive side, how can we, you know, proactively work to to keep men from becoming that way? Um, I would definitely um, say it's emulating Christ. So it's emulating Christ's leadership, how he led. Um, how he led on the earth, how he led his disciples, how he led his bride and encouraging one another to pursue each other via servant leadership. So it's never dominating and controlling one another. So I would definitely say whenever you see instances of other men that are oppressing their wives or dominating, especially if they ever force submission, submission is never, ever forced. Whenever it's um, forced, it becomes subjugation. It's that's abuse and that's wrong. So I would think anytime that you see an entitled um, mentality in your church, um, if you 
you were a complementarian church that they're talking about submissive or my wife's not submissive or my wife's not this. It's like, okay, are you like Jesus? Have you laid down your life for Christ for her today? You know what I mean? Like, it's like you, you need to not be looking at the sins of your wife and the wife needs to be not looking at the sins of their husband. Yes. Hold each other accountable. Um, I believe that you are called to be faithful to one another. And that faithfulness is also being willing to point out when one another is wrong and being willing to heed that and be willing to go to the Lord and repent and grow together in Christ and Christ likeness. But as men and women is pointing each other out too, I mean like, Hey, you know, I don't think the way you spoke to your husband, um, you know, was very kind, you know, um, and, and or way you spoke to your wife or what's going on here was, was very Christ like. And so let's talk about this. How can I hold you accountable? You know, where, where are you struggling? And it's getting um, intimate with one another. The church I was in did do that intimate with one another and finding out where their struggles are, where are your weaknesses? We're all humans. We all have issues we're struggling and walking through and it's being willing to be accountable and grow through that. Um, if there is a woman here today who wants to leave but doesn't know what next steps are, mm -hmm. what can she do? Um, if you feel that you're in a domestically abusive marriage, the first thing I always do is say contact an advocate. We have free advocates at Call to Peace Ministries. Um, you can find it at www.calledtopeace.org. Go down to who we help, and I think it's by the bottom left corner. It says request an advocate or email info at calledtopeace.org, and they will be able to connect you with an advocate. An advocate will be able to help you get together an escape plan um, if that is what is needed, but they're never going to force you to do that. They will help you be able to make informed choices and kind of look at your marriage. They can do something called a scale, evaluate where you really are, you know, how much danger you really are in. Um, so I know they do that interact as well. And like you can, like they go through and check and see if certain things are there. And if all these things are there, you can be, the lethality index can get very high. And if it's there, they might be like, you need to look at this very seriously and get out right now um, and get your escape plan together. Um, if not, they'll be like, okay, you've got some time. Let's kind of put, put together a plan. Let's kind of get things together financially. Let's think about this. Let's think about the legal system. How do you document? and things like that. And we also have a lawyer that we work with as well. He's a, who's a very strong Christian, wonderful woman, Tiffany, Tiffany Lesnick. She's on our board and, um, yeah, helps women, does free consultation, helps them understand the ins and outs of the legal system and how to walk through it. Mm -hmm. um, last question. How can, uh, for anyone who wants to be more involved with Called to Peace, what are ways that people can be involved? Um, we definitely, well, you can be involved through financial giving as always a way you can become a monthly partner. I do just $10 a month. <laughs> I know that's not a lot, but that's $120 a year and $120 a year provides one hour of crisis counseling to a woman in need. So at Call to Peace Ministries, we assist women, um, also financially. So we will help a woman get a apartment um, with her down payment. We've given women cars. We help women with medical bills as well as pay for them to go through therapy. Um, not every single woman who do we pay to go through therapy, but like there is sometimes they are very traumatized and they are needing professional help beyond what an advocate or a support group is able to offer them. So we will, we have a therapist that we work with and we'll get them into therapy and, and help them heal. Um, so yes, we never turn a woman away for cost. Everything is free to women. The advocates are free. The support groups are free. Um, we do retreats once a year and they are, we offer scholarships to any woman that is not able to afford it. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of ways and um, there's financial needs. There's also volunteering. If you desire, want, desire to volunteer at an event, um, desire to lead a support group or to become an advocate, we would love that. Advocacy training program? Yes. So our advocacy training is a year-long program. It's 100 hours. Um, you're in it, right? Yes, I, I'm in it, and I take breaks here and there. Um, right now, it's Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and during May, I took a break, too, because of the retreat. So I just um, have to focus. But I'll be back in November, but it's awesome. I love the advocacy um, courses. I have learned so much through it, the dynamics of abuse. This lady is amazing. I think she's been teaching for around 20 years um, domestic violence, so she knows it like nobody else, knows the ins and outs. She teaches about dynamics of um, what it looks like for men to be in abusive relationships to what the effects are on children. Um, and it is a thorough course. You will, it's like drinking out of a fire hose, but it's, it's really phenomenal. Um, you will learn a lot about domestic abuse. And I actually recommend any woman that's ever been through domestic abuse to go through our advocacy training because it's hugely healing. Knowledge is always power. Knowledge always heals. Like understanding the dynamics of what you've been and lived through is where a lot of healing is fine. It also brings out a lot of pain because you have to then face the fact that that's abuse and that's wrong, but it is very healing when you're able to face it and you can't live in denial. You face the reality and find healing in Christ for what he says. So, awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you for having me. This yeah. is great. This has been super, super helpful. Um, very encouraging, very challenging. Um,
Just so y'all know, as she mentioned, you guys can give anyone who wants directly to Call to Peace. Um, you guys can also give, um, we have a fund set up uh, through our giving portal as well. And at the end of the month, whatever's in there, we'll, we'll give to Call to Peace as well. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so you can give online or give through a check um, to help support uh, this incredible ministry. I yeah. can also vouch for the advocacy program. It is like drinking through a fire hydrant, but it is incredibly helpful, mm -hmm. ridiculously thorough. Um, not only the dynamics and like the effects on people, but like legal systems and counseling things. Oh, and yes. like, it's just, it's, yeah, it's, it's intense, but it's great. So, you know, if you're getting an advocate they're they're yeah. well, well trained, they, they know the ins and outs. Yeah, I would expect that probably call to peace advocates are, I mean, I don't, I'm not super familiar with other advocacy programs, but like, it would surprise me if, if there were many others that could compete with oh, yeah. the level of training received. Well, you've got Joy and Deborah as well. They both have tw like 45 years combined experience. So if there ever becomes a case, they can't. Somebody's like, I'm stumped, which can happen to an advocate. I mean, not as often, but like, I, I don't to do. They call Deborah and, and Joy are happy to get on the phone and be like, okay, let's think through this. So you just have, I don't know any other organization that has 45 years of, ex well, there is some. There's Julie Owens and Darby Strickland who also have years of experience, but I don't know about their advocacy if they even offer advocates, but there is people out there that are very, very experienced. Um, but the fact that they are willing to, they understand the ins and outs as well. I don't know of many other people that do. So awesome. Uh, one last question that came in, does call to peace, the financial aid, do they help with like housing and that kind of thing? Yes, we do. So we give um, down payments to women that are escaping because usually they have no money. They've also given women free cars as well. Um, like that's through another avenue that that's happened. But um, so yes, trying to help women get back on their feet. Um, the women would have to be in a support group and in our advocacy program. Like it can't just be women calling us up and be like, I need a down payment for an apartment. You have to be actually engaged and involved in it. So well, are you uh, hanging out? We have lunch. Are you hanging out a little bit afterward? Can people come yeah, up and Yeah, I'm ask hanging out. Today is my daughter's birthday party. Oh, no. So, yes, no, it's not till like four. So, I have to get back a little bit where uh, she'll be 10 on Tuesday. So, I am preparing uh, that today. So, I'll be here for a little bit. Okay. But, yes. Great. Well, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to chat with Lauren while we're eating lunch and everything. Yes. So, but yeah, come find me probably quicker than later so I can, because um, I need to get home and plan that for her. Awesome. Well, can I pray for you real yes, quick? Yes, please. We'll thank you. Up. Father, I thank you so much for today. Lord, I thank you for Lauren and for Call to Peace Ministries. Lord, for her willingness to be here um, and to uh, just share her story, share from Lord, her, her experience, her knowledge of these things. God, we thank you for your heart for the oppressed and um, the downtrodden. God, and I pray that here at Rooted, we would cultivate that same kind of heart. Um, Lord, for, for people, for women, for men, Lord, who are in these kinds of relationships and do everything that we can to help. In the name of Jesus, amen.